ill of COVID-19 pandemic. Before we start this uh, virtual international joint lecture, I would like to thank you to Vice Rector of Planning and Cooperation of Fair Universitas Marijaya, Ahmad Sasmuto Jati, Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science, Professor Dr. Bambang Supriyono, Dean of Academic of Assistant Professor Yusri Abdullah, PhD, Vice Dean of Finance and General Affair, Associate Professor Dr. Hamida Nayati Utami, and Vice Dean of Student Affair, Assistant Professor Dr. Muhammad Razikin, Head of Department of Public Administration, Associate Professor Andi Fefta Vijay, PhD, Ambassador of Republic of Indonesia for Brazil, His Excellency, Mr. Adi Yusuf. Honorable guest speakers, all of faculty members, and all of audience for joining this event. I will read our agenda for today. We will start our event with prayer and opening speeches, and we will continue with the main agenda with our keynote speakers and discussions, question and answer sessions, and will be ended with concluding remarks. And for the question, if the audience have a question, you can send the question in the chat section on Zoom or comment section on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our honorable guest speakers for tonight. The first one is Mr. Prabowo Subianto, Minister of Defense of Republic Indonesia, that will be rep represented by Middle Admiral Dr. A. Octavian from Universitas Pertahanan Indonesia, Dr. Air Force Commander in Jayapura, Armor Defense Attache in Brazil, Petra Faisal Hastiadi, PhD, from Universitas Indonesia. Professor Dr. Jose Marcio Carvalho, from University of Brasilia. And the last one, but not least, of course, Muhammad Iqbal, DBA, from Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Prawijaya. Ladies and gentlemen, before we carry on the next agenda, let me invite Mr. Alfi Hariswanto, PhD, to deliver Mr. Alfi Hariswanto, PhD. The time is yours. Okay, thank you, Ms. Alia. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Alhamdulillahi wa alameen. Allahumma aftah lana hikmataka wa mshur alayna rahmataka min khazaini rahmataka ya arhamar rahimin. O oh Allah, we pray that you bless all the speakers, committees, and participants, that they may be able to fulfill their tasks responsibly, that the objective they have set may all be achieved. Your infinite blessing would be the success of this international case lecture program. Make us a living witnesses of your genuine love through the enlargement of the knowledge acquired through this activity. Rabbana taqobal minna inna anta sami al alim, wa tubu alayna inna ka anta tawadirahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azabannar wa sallallahu ala sayidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayidina Muhammad alhamdulillahirabbil alamin Thank you Mr. Aris Alfi Haris PhD At this time I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Andi Fefta Wijaya PhD Head of Public Administration Department, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Prawijaya, who serve as the host of this event to give welcome remarks. To Associate Professor Andy Fafta Vijay, PhD, the time is yours. Associate Professor Andy Fefta Wijaya. Okay, sorry. I still mute, yeah. Okay, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat. Good evening. Buat konbanwan. My Excellency, Dean Faculty of Administrative Science, and also Vice Dean, Vice Director for Cooperation and Planning, University of Prawijaya, 
Indonesian Ambassador in Brazil, YouTube, and Rector of Universitas Pertahanan, Bapak Laksda TNI A. Octavian S.T. D.S.D. is a representative of the Indonesian Minister of Defense, Bapak Letjen uh, TNI Prabowo Subianto. And also my speaker, Professor Dr. Jos Masyu Karvalho, Bapak Dr. Bu Ahmadi, Bapak Fitra Faisal, and Bapak Muhammad Iqbal. All lecturers, all students, all participants, respectable all members of the organizing committee from my faculty to make this event. First of all, let's pray and thank to our God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for giving us a blessing so we can attend and gather in this event in a good condition and happy situation. Secondly, thank you to all of you for being here today at this wonderful event. It is such an honor for me to speak on behalf of the Department of Public Administration, Faculty of Science, Bravia. Let me begin by giving you a warm welcome to this International Joint Lecture 2 in the Public and Business Policy. Before we get started, express my appreciation to the University of Brasilia to make this joint lecture come true. Professor Dr. Jos Marcio Carvalho, Professor Dr. Sigurd Willemont Dehat, and also Professor Dr. Herbert Kimura. We visited your university in 2019 and experienced a great activity to sign MOU in our universities. We also give a best appreciation to the Indonesian Embassy and Ambassador in Brazil. The event Embassy at Brazil, Dr. Budi Ahmadi, during our visit in Brazil in 2019. Last year, on 8th, from the of Brasilia planned to visit us and have joined the activity at Universitas Brasilia. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, so we cancel it. I hope next time you can visit us in our lovely campus here in Universitas Brasilia. Now into 24 February 2021, we meet again in this virtual event, International Joint Lecture Series 2. As our expectation, this activity is only the beginning of our collaboration. Next semester in this year, we are going to, to do a virtual student exchange and lecturer exchange because of the current situation of COVID-19 pandemic. So we will arrange our activity by daring or online system as we do currently with other universities abroad. This international le joint lecture too today is attended by 1,000 registered participants. The participants Hello. come from countries Indonesia, Brazil, Japan, Timor Leste, Thailand, and Malaysia. This is an, an improvement in terms of the participant numbers because in the International Joint Lecture Series 1 last month, conducted also by our Department of Public Administration on 15 January 2021, attended by eight registered participants. In today's joint lecture, we hold like to learn public policy is of international trade industry between Indonesia and Brazil. Today, we invite experienced speakers from both sides, public and business academicians, and I hope you can learn from these joint lectures today for the microphone. Well, I do not want to take too much of your time. I would like to say once more. On behalf of our Department of Public Administration, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Brawijaya, welcome to this joint lecture. It is great to see so many of you here. Thank you. Hello, Jamata, Kupon, Kapun, and Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Associate Professor Andi Krafta Wijaya PhD. Next, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Babang Supriyono, Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Surabaya, to give opening speech to Professor Dr. Babang Supriyono. The time is yours. of planning and cooperation Universitas Pravijaya from GPC as the host of this insightful and prodigious event in lecture conducted by the Department of Public Administration. It is very excellent the of administrative regarding the topic. First, Bapak Laksamana Matia TNI Dr. Octavian SDMSCD ASD, Department of Economics, Universitas Indonesia, Professor Dr. Susi Marcio Carvalho, Professor and apart from speakers, we also have outstanding discussions who will dissect the presentations of the speakers and discovery of administrative science, Universitas Brawijaya. Christine Manulang, student of Business Administration Department, Faculty, of administrative science, one country needs another country to achieve its goals. 
the first developing economy economy this mutual correlations are from the necessity of what one by relationship among countries is significant rules in international society including in the global politics and the national policy making process this significant is also the elegant global Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Mamang Supriyono. Next, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Muhammad Sasmito Chati, Vice Director of Planning and Cooperation Affairs, Universitas Brawijaya, to give opening speech to Professor Dr. Bambang Muhammad Sasmito Chati. Time is yours. Professor Dr. Muhammad Sasmito Chati. Are you still in this Zoom meeting room? To Professor Dr. Muhammad Sasmito Chati. the vice rector of Universitas Brawijaya. Uh, oh yeah. The professor Muhammad is he still here? Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear my voice clearly? 
Yes, clear. Um, uh, to Professor Dr. Muhammad Tasmi Tosyati. Is he still here? Maybe okay, Pak okay. Oscar have information. Okay, okay. Um, okay. They just start for unmute, so I cannot, um, I cannot say anything. Okay. Is that my voice is clear? Okay. Yes, clear. Prof. Time is yours. It is clear, my clear. voice. Yes, it's clear, clear okay. Prof. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah. Good morning Salam. for Indonesia. Hey, sorry. Good okay. evening for Indonesia, and also good morning for Brazilian. Uh, welcome to Zoom meeting in International Joint Lecture in Public and Business Policy entitled A Case of International Trade and Industry between Indonesia and Southeast Asia and Brazil, Latin America. Is it clear my voice? Clear. Clear, Prof. Sass. Thank you. It is clear. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Hey. Um, First of all, on behalf of our university, I would like to thanks to all of you, international student participant of Zoom meeting in international joint lecture in public and business policy entitled a case of international trade and industry between Indonesia, Southeast Asian and uh, Brazil and Latin America. To all speaker from Indone uh, Indonesian ambassador of Brazil, Lieutenant General of uh, Retire, Pak Prabowo Subianto, with entitled Indonesian Industrial Policy, Bapak Budi Ahmadi, Air Force Base Commander in Jayapura, defend atas Brazil, entitled Comparative Public Policy and defend Industrial Base Indonesian and Brazil Case of Study, Mr. V. Tra Faisal has studied PhD from Universitas Indonesia, entitled Globalization, Productivity and Production Network in ASEAN, Enhancing Regional Trade and Investment. Professor Dr. Jose Marcio Carvalho, University of Brasilia, Brazil, Indonesia, International Avenue and Opportunities. And uh, Mr. Muhammad Iqbal, SOS MIB DBE from UB. Digital economy in Indonesia and need of policy support and entrepreneurial base of perspective. And all of the organizing committee, Dean of Faculty of uh, Administration of Brawijaya University, I would like to say thanks that you all organize. I hope uh, this meeting will be useful for us. I just want to say thanks to Brazil University. And we think about Indonesia and Brazil is the tropical country that we know is in tropical country. And also Indonesia and Brazil is, you know, the biggest or the best mega biodiversity in the world. Brazil is the first and Indonesia is the second bio, uh, bio, biodiversity, mega biodiversity in the world. And also Indonesia and Brazil is multi-ethnic country. We have uh, almost same problem to meet our future, to meet our country. This, I think we believe it's not easy for us. Brazil also inland with a very wide, a very long beach, but Indonesia, it's our archipelago's country. I think the best archipelago country in the world is Indonesia. And uh, we think about our different different system. It's not easy for us. So we, we should think about the different system mindset, should be think about defense, not just spending money, but how to earn the money from defense system. So what we call it, this is an industrial uh, defense system. We think about our future, we should be discuss each other. And uh, I hope in this meeting, we will be um, many fruitful, many good outcome. And I hope all of you will uh, have a very good seminar 
and gain our favorable outcome. And then uh, thank, thank you uh, very much for all of you. And I hope in this meeting, we can make some conclusion with useful for both country, Indonesian and also Brazilian. I think uh, more of all of that, um, after the pandemic of COVID-19, we just talk about the very small unseen creative, but it is giving a great impact to all of us for our da daily life, our habit, and our important thing is, is our way of life that means very, very useful for us. Even we are in a distance, but we can communicate each other, become more much easy for us. And this occasion, as what you want to say, uh, we will say, uh, open this, this meeting with the name of God, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. That's all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Muhammad Sasmito Shati. Now I would like to invite His Excellency Mr. Adi Yusuf, Ambassador of Republic Indonesia oh, for Brazil, to give opening speech. Uh, to Mr. Adi Yusuf, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. It's very clear. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang terhormat Bapak Profesor Dr. Muhammad Sasmito Jati, Vice Rector of University of Brawijaya, Dear Professor Marcio, University of Brasilia, Distinguished Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and very good evening. First of all, Allow me to express my sincere appreciation to University of Brawijaya and University of Brasilia for organizing this international joint lecture on public and business policy. This is very timely as Indonesia and Brazil are still battling against the COVID-19 pandemic. And worse, this pandemic unfolds at the back of our symptom global situation. The IMF recent report suggests that an escalation in geopolitical tension poses a threat to our global value chains, create major economic risks, and in turn reduce global growth. Against this backdrop, I have three proposals for your consideration. First, we must strengthen our collaboration and cooperation. Second, we must recover together. In this difficult situation, the world needs new hope and optimism. And we have seen encouraging signs in our path to economic recovery. To add to this momentum, we must reconnect our economies and businesses by making use of all available tools at our disposal, from free trade agreements to essential business corridors. The third proposal is to set our vision for future cooperation. Our economic cooperation currently do not reflect true potential. In year 2020, for instance, our total bilateral trade was only 3.2 billion US dollars. In my opinion, this is too small for countries uh, like us as middle power country. I think we should double the figure to at least 5 billion in the near future. In order to unlock the real economic potential, we must be able to adopt new approaches and create breakthrough. In this regard, I'm of the view that we should now focus on two elements or two issues. The first issue is to create more opportunities. And Indonesia stands ready to establish new trade agreement with Brazil under the umbrella of Indonesia-Mercosur Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Just for your information, we have just con conducted two exploratory meetings in 2019 and 2020 
and we do hope that the negotiation on Indonesia Mercosur Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement can be started this year. The second issue, we must discover new opportunities in digital economy, in green economy, and in defense industry. Indonesia is the fastest growing and largest digital economy in Southeast Asia with a predicted value of 133 billion US dollars. I've noticed that Brazil is also experiencing a rapid progress in digital economy. Indonesia stands ready to develop cooperation with Brazil in startup and e-commerce. Just for your information, Indonesian government has established Indonesia Latin America digital um, Latin America Caribbean digital platform as one of the tools to showcase our products, to seek investment opportunities, and to update business activities in both regions. We need to institutionalize these digital platforms, and I'm pleased to inform you that Brazilian business have participated actively in this uh, digital platform. On green economic cooperation, Indonesia is committed to enhance the use of renewable energy and continue developing palm oil-based biofuel innovation and processing technology to support national energy independence. In this regard, we welcome the initiative to explore cooperation in ethanol industry including the development of ethanol fuel cells. This is an excellent initiative, and I'm sure that we could establish joint development on biodiesel and biofuel in the future. Finally, in defense cooperation, we need to ensure that the transfer of rocket technology from Avibras as part of the purchase contract for the multi-launching rocket system at Astros can be implemented timely and effectively. We need also to explore market opportunities in Brazil for military uniforms produced by Indonesian textile industry. These military uniforms already achieve NATO standard qualification. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very productive and fruitful discussion. I thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency Mr. Adi Yusuf. Before we start to the main session, let's take a picture together first. So please, um, our host, prepare yourself so we can take a picture together. And ladies and gentlemen, please put a nice smile to your camera. Are we ready? Okay. The photo session is still going on. It will take a while. We are still taking picture. Don't forget to smile. Okay, we're done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now let's start to the main session of our event today. The main agenda will be led by our moderator, Asti Amelia Novita, PhD. Please welcome Asti Amelia Novita, PhD. Mrs. Asti, the session is yours. Mrs. Asti, our moderator. 
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Miss Aulia. Could you hear my voice clearly? Yes, very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Aulia, for um, for the opportunity today. So, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good evening for Indonesia and good morning for Brazil, for Asia. Let me greet our um, our important guest, His Excellency Bapak Laksamana Majat NE Dr. A. Octavian SDMSC DESD, Director of Indonesian Defense University or Universitas Pertahanan Indonesia. His Excellency Bapak Edi Yusuf as uh, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia for Brazil. The Honorable Vice Rector of Planning and Cooperation Universitas Prawijaya, Professor Dr. Insinyur Muhammad uh, Sasmito Jati, uh, the Honorable the Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science Universitas Prawijaya, Professor Dr. Bambang Supriyono MS, our Head of Department of Public Administration, Faculty of Administrative Science, as well as our host of this insightful and prestigious event today. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Andes Andi Vefta Wijaya, MDA PhD, uh, distinguished speakers, colleagues, students, and participants. So let me welcome you to the International Journal Lecture. As you know, the untitled Public and Business Policy, a case of international trade and industry. I'm Astia Melia Novita and will be serve you as the moderator of today's event. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this international joint lecture conducted by Public Administration Department Universitas Prawijaya in collaboration with University of Brasilia. As mentioned by our dean, also this seminar will discuss uh, more deeply about the policy related to the international trade and industry in the public and business perspective. Of course, we also discuss about the relations and co collaborations and also be between Indonesia and Brazil. To open our main session, let us first have a speech from our keynote speaker, Bapa Laksamana Majiat NE, Dr. Amrula Octavian, STMSG DESD. So let me give you a very brief introduction about our keynote speaker, Bapak Laksamana Majiat NE, Dr. Amarula Octavian, STMS CDESD, is a high ranking officer of the Indonesian Navy who graduated from the Naval Academy in 1988 and currently serve as director of the Universitas Pertahanan Indonesia. Previously, he was the commander of Naval Staff and Command College, and he graduated doctorate from the Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas Indonesia in 2013. Let's welcome our keynote speaker, Bapak Laksamana Majat NE, Dr. Amarulo Octavian, SDMSG, DESG. So time is your Bapak. Bapak Octavian. Oh, oh, uh, for our host, please uh, mute uh, the the yeah the Bapak Octavian still mute. Could you yeah. help us uh, to you. put it yeah, aside? So, assist okay, us. yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, I would like uh, to share my uh, uh, slide. Is it clear already? Is it presented? Yes. Yes. Clearly. Perfect. About my voice. My voice? Yes, of course, clearly. Perfect. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, distinguished uh, uh, Vice Rector of uh, University of Brawijaya, Professor uh, Sasmito Jati, His Excellency Indonesian Ambassador in Brazil, His Excellency Mr. Uh, Eddie Yusuf, Dean of uh, Administration Science Faculty, 
University of Brawijaya Profesor Bambang Supriyono, uh, Profesor Jose Marcio Carvalho from uh, University of uh, Brasilia, and all speaker, uh, Dr. Budi Ahmadi, uh, Mr. Fitria Faisal Astia di PSD, and also uh, Mr. Muhammad Iqbal. Distinguished guests, Professor Senior Officer, participant of international joint lecture between University of Brawijaya and University of Brasilia. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening in Indonesia and good morning in Brazil. First of all, let us praise the Almighty God for his blessing upon us that we are able to participate in today international joint lecture between University of uh, Brawijaya and University of uh, Brasilia. Uh, this thing is a uh, participant. First of all, uh, please allow, allow me to introduce myself uh, as I have already uh, mentioned by the uh, Master of Ceremony. I am a best, uh, Vice Admiral Dr. Amarullah Octavian, the Rector of the Republic of Indonesia Defense University, representing the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Indonesia, and would like to deliver a presentation on Indonesian defense industrial policy. My presentation outline consists of First, the law and regulation which provide the legal basis for Indonesia defense industry uh, development. The second, Indonesian defense industrial policy initiative. Third, the current status of Indonesian defense industries. And the last is summary. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three important legal basis regarding the development of Indonesia defense industry. First, Indonesian law, law number 16, year 2012 on defense industry. The second is the decree of uh, Industrial uh, Defense uh, Committee Chairman, number seven, year 2014 on national defense industry program. And the last is the government decree, number 141, year 2015. Defense industry is a national industry consisting of state-owned and private-owned companies determined by the government to partially or wholly produce defense and security equipment as well as maintenance services to meet strategic interests of the Republic of Indonesia in the field of defense and security. Since the enactment of the law number 11 year 2020 on job creation private companies have been involved to participate in the construction of defense related equipment as well as to become lab integrator according to law number three year 2002 regarding national defense particularly in article number 16 and 23 Ministry of Defense is responsible to establish policies and foster defense industrial technology in order to improve the ability of national defense. This duty is carried out through conducting research and development of defense industry and technology. So in the Indonesian defense industry will be able to produce and perform maintenance on defense equipment and system independently. To remove independent national defense industry, the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Indonesia has set the direction of defense technology with strategy through defense industry participation, foreign cooperation, and national research and development. The strategy is implemented in the form of the counter trade and local content offset, joint development, joint venture, joint production and consortium, which aim to make national defense industry become more professional, effective, efficient, integrated, and innovative. For instance, in terms of foreign cooperation on the procurement of submarines, PTPAL collaborate with the SME Korea in the joint production of 
three submarine. The three pillars in defense industry development comprise of the government, users, and the def defense uh, industry. Its stakeholders have their respective role as shown in the slide. The three institutions must force synergy and collaboration in developing the defense industry. To improve state defense capability through revitalization of national defense industry in producing weapon system and equipment, the direction of defense technology development is determined based on user need and threat dynamic with comprise of the following aspect, strategic value, high technology, long-term usage, economic feasibility, transfer of technology, cross-government, cross-ministries and agencies. As the Defense Industry Policy Committee in Indonesia decides seven priority programs that consist of submarine, Korea fighter experiment, or Indonesia fighter experiment, fighter, medium tank, rocket, missile, radar, and propellant. The presidential decree number eight, year 2021, add three priority program that consists of unmanned aerial vehicle, military satellite, and underwater sensor. Now I'm going to move to discuss defense industry policy initiative in Indonesia. All the distinguished participants, since the issuance of law number 16, year 2012 on defense industry, the government has shown its commitment to build in the independent defense industry. To realize this commitment, the Ministry of Defense has six program, namely implementation of offset, international cooperation, defense industry promotion, licensing of defense industry and blasting enterprises, production of first article, and seven plus three national priority program. To strengthen its national defense industry, the government of Indonesia has implemented local content and offset regulation for all defense system and equipment procurement from abroad. Currently, 33 local content of offset agreement have been signed and in progress. This policy need to be continuously evaluated and improved. Some countries that has engaged in cooperation with Indonesia under the, this program are United States of America, Netherlands, Brazil, South Korea, France, Turkey, Switzerland, Russia, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. Defense industrial cooperation between Indonesia and Brazil so far has been going very well. One of the example is the Astros MK6 offset program from Avibras Industrial Aerospatial Brazil. This offset program has led to the improvement of Indonesian ability to produce military equipment through transfer of technology, educating and training, joint development, and other cooperation mechanism. This second defense industry development policy is the international cooperation with foreign partner to improve the ability of Indonesian defense industry. Indonesia and Brazil themselves have developed strong cooperation and currently there are several ongoing programs between the two countries. We are also conduct an annual bilateral defense industry meeting with Korea, Turkey, Russia, and China. We also hope that we may have similar program with Brazil in the future. 
The third defense industry development policy is promotion of defense industry through international exhibition. However, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, we have to postpone all promotion program in 2020. We hope that the situation will get better in the near future. So we will be able to carry out this program again. As part of the promotion program, we also hold Indo-Defense uh, Biennial Expo and Forum. We achieved a new record of attendance in Indo-Defense 2018. We also thank Brazil that has continuously participated in Indo-Defense through its country pavilion. The next Indo-Defense is planned to be held in 2022. I hope all participants will attend this exhibition. Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth program in licensing of defense industry and blasting enterprises. In total, currently 138 defense industry and 11 blasting enterprises have been registered in Indonesia. The fifth program is production of first article. In 2015, the government of Indonesia, through the Ministry of National Development Planning, enacted a policy to restore the function of the defense industry technology de development budget allocation. In particular, with pure rupiah, Indonesian money, as the means for defense industry technology development. It also serves as a form of incentive provided by the government to national defense industries for any development-oriented activities in defense industry technology. The sixth program is the seventh national priority program, the progress of Korea fighter experiment and Indonesia fighter experiment, radar, missile, and propellant programs are, are shown in the slide. In terms of medium tank, this year, PT Pindad will start the mass production of its medium tank. In terms of submarine program, this year, Itipal will become the main contractor for the third submarine procurement. In terms of the rocket program, this year, the rocket will be ready for mass production. According to the presidential decree number eight, year 2021, there are three more additional pro priority program, namely unmanned aerial vehicle, military satellite and underwater sensor. Ladies and gentlemen, on the next slide, I'm going to provide update on the current status of Indonesian defense industry. This slide explains technological and manufacturing readiness level of Indonesian defense industry in 2020. Some have achieved advanced level, but some still remain at the entry level. To maintain the comp competitiveness of defense industries, innovation is a must. Therefore, universities and research inst institution involvement is necessary. And I do hope this joint lecture may serve to strengthen the cooperation between universities and industries, as well as between national states. Distinguished participants, to close the presentation, I would like to sum up some important points. Initiative to develop Indonesian defense industries consists of six main policies, as shown in the slide. Law number 16 
year 2012 and its revision in law number 11 year 2020 boost Indonesian defense industries development so far the development of Indonesian defense industries in on the right track and we are proud to be one of the leader in the region in developing national defense industries universities and research inst institution plays important role to promote continuous innovation we also perceive brazil as one of the most important partner for indonesia in developing its defense industries therefore the ongoing program should be continued strengthened and developed for the mutual benefit of the two countries i thank you okay okay thank you very much papa Laksamana Madya TNI Dr. Amarullah Octavian for such for giving us such uh, enlightening speech. We already hear from uh, Bapak Amarullah Octavian that Indonesian have six policy initiative to develop and strengthen the Indonesian defense industry and also the importance or the urgency of universities and research institutions involvement to um promote continuous innovation and improvement in the uh, Indonesian defense uh, industry. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, uh, thank you very much again for uh, Bapak Amarullah Octavian for giving such uh, enlightenment speech and presentation for us. And ladies and gentlemen, to continue our main sessions, today we have four speakers and three discussions from Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Budi Ahmadi, MSG, the I-4 Space Commander, Jayapura, and he will talk about comparative public policy on the defense industrial base with a case study of Indonesia and Brasilia. Good evening, Dr. Budi Ahmadi. Hola. Hola. So uh, let me introduce our speakers and discussion first, then after that we are moving to the presentation. Is it clear? Ah, clear enough. Perfectly. Thank you. Okay. So the second speaker, we have a Bapak Fitra Faisal Hastiadi, lecturer of Universitas of Indonesia, and we'll talk about globalization productivity. Good evening, Bapak Fitra Faisal Hastiadi, PhD. Okay, and the third speaker is Professor Dr. Jose Marcio Carvalho, the professor of University of Brasilia. And the last speaker, we also have Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, SOS MIB DBS, uh, DBA. So, uh, and for the discussion will be Dr. Sigrid and also two students of our faculty. So, uh, so uh, we, let's start with our uh, sessions. But before uh, Bapak Dr. Budi Ahmadi give uh, presentations, First, let me read a short biography of our first speaker. Bapak Dr. Budi Ahmadi uh, was born in Magetan, East Java, Indonesia, and in 25th October 1972, he graduated from doctoral program in public administration, Universitas Prawijaya in 2018, and he been served as defense attach, attach uh, Brazil in 2016, and right now he serves as Air Force Base Commander in Jayapura. He also received 13 military medals also, and the last medal is Santos Pumon Medal Brazil. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bapak Budi Ahmadi. Yes, so, Alhamdulillah, it is correct. Now, allow me to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Budi Ahmadi, to deliver his presentation. So time is yours, Bapak. Thank you. Uh, Excellencies, uh, Laksamana Madia uh, Oktavian, Ambassadors Edi Yusuf, uh, <coughs> Rector, Dean, Professor Bambang Supriyono, uh, Honorable Senior Officials, Lecturers, and Speakers. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, buon noche, para todos. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to quickly introduce myself, uh, as mentioned before, I'm Air Force Marshal Budi Ahmadi from Indonesian Air Force, and also the alumni of the doctoral program of the public administration 
Science Faculty, University of Brawijaya. And uh, this evening, I might be one who know more about Brazil than any other Indonesian joining this lecture, except uh, Ambassador Edi Yusuf. And I thank you also for uh, Professor Mar Marzio. You promised me to come, in, to, come uh, to Malang, but tonight you only come uh, into uh, my uh, digital yeah. glass, but thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if compared with other speakers, my presentation is uh, very unique, even very strange. Because a few people, only a few people here, I believe, are directly connected with the work of the Defense Industrial Base, or DIB. This terminology itself, until now, not uh, officially used uh, by Indonesian government. And I can say with you, uh, the terminolo terminology of uh, DIB or Defense Industrial Base, uh, firstly, uh, came from the United States uh, Office of Technology Assessment. DIB is a combination of human labor, institution, technology, and facilities used to design, develop, produce and maintain weapons and defense support equipment needed to meet national security objectives. In this case, the IB is the combination of the industries which directly produce the defense products and other entities that indirectly produce the defense product. It is clear that the DIB subject is wider subject than defense industry itself. Based on Herbert Wolf paradigm of the defense industrial base, I can say with you, there are five models to build defense industrial base. It can be direct import, local assembly, basic local assembly, license production and local design and production. Why the defense industrial base needs public administration? The utilization of the public administration into the DIB start from the understanding of the public goods in economic theory. Defense products are public goods whereby no individual can be excluded from the from benefiting from it. In other words, everyone can benefit from its use, such as education, security, defense, or a natural public good such as air. So the characteristic of public goods such as defense product, uh, non-rivalry, and non-excludability. I believe most of you have critical questions. Why my comparative study in Indonesia and Brazil is still quite relevant? Even though the stride distance from Jakarta to Brasilia is 16,301 kilometers, indeed, both given industrial bases have interrelated issues as below. Truly, Indonesia and Brazil were occupied by the same colonialists in early 16th century, Portugal. And Indonesia and Brazil are both continentalists in public administration. Both countries are also developing countries and G20 members. And Indonesia is number 15 in the world in terms of GDP and Brazil is number nine in the world. Both countries are topics in their regional or area in terms of GDP. Indonesian population is number four in the world and Brazil is number six. And Indonesian territory is number 15 and Brazil is number five in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Based on the world rank recorded by CIPRI, Indonesia is number 36 in arm export and number 16 in uh, arm import. 
and Brazil is number 22 in arm export and number 33 in arm export. Most important to be noted, Brazil has Embraer. Now Embraer is the giant commercial aircraft industry that position number four in the world after Boeing, Airbus, M and Bombardier. Brazil is, is Federative Republic and Indonesia is United Republic, but surely there is no specific difference popping up from those issues, those issues since the DIB is controlled by the central government. Let's check the comparative uh, defense industrial base in Indonesia and Brazil. Indonesia started its first defense industrial base in 1808. It is the it is constructive vehicle now Pindad. Now Indonesia has around 52 industrial bases. Brazil started its first defense industrial basis in uh, 1762, uh, called as Arsenal de Geha in Rio de Janeiro, now has 250 industries, uh, I mean uh, defense industries. First private uh, defense industrial base in Indonesia is Tesco Indomaritim, founded in 1975. And first private uh, defense industrial base in Brazil started in 1921. Uh, now called as CBC. I myself uh, ever visited CBC in 2017. Indonesia and Brazilian defense industrial bases have same status in 1980s as copier, copier and reproducer. But now Brazil is producer, but Indonesia still stagnant, like in 1980s, as copier, copier and reproducer. Both countries use transfer technology from modern countries as technology, technology acquisition strategy. Both countries put self-sufficiency and economic contribution as the policies, policy target. Both countries use legislation, local product protection, and cooperation as the policy strategies. As the controller, Indonesia has KKIP or KKIP to manage and control the defense industrial basis policy. Led by, led by uh, President, Brazil has uh, CMID, Commission Mista, the Industria de Defesa, to manage uh, its uh, defense industrial base, uh, led by Ministry of Defense. If we observe the DIB, policy in Indonesia, we can find some lesson learned as follows. Initiation of defense industrial base in Indonesia were dominated by the political consideration and lack of market or business analysis. I myself, in uh, for Indonesian, I think uh, we know about uh, Mr. Uh, Habibi in 2015, I visited him and I knew how uh, he start uh, the uh, industrial uh, in uh, the defense industry in Indonesia based on uh, politic, uh, based on the political order from uh, Mr. Suharto, uh, mostly based on uh, his political view, not based on the market demand. Uh, until now, Indonesia continuously leans on state-owned uh, actors than private actors in which the government must spend more money not only for the project, not only for the research, but also to survive the company. Indonesia also started uh, the defense industrial base with the poor condition of the local industrial and technological base. Uh, I mean the commercial uh, industry. For some reason, there is no trickle-down effect uh, from the commercial uh, business at the time. The lack of local supply chain also happened in Indonesia. The lack of penalty. Uh, from my observation, most of the legislation related to the defense industrial base in Indonesia are very loose 
or weak toward the government actor that are not loyal to the obligation of supporting, protecting, and purchasing the local defense product. Moral hazard. In Indonesian case, moral hazard pop up when most state-owned companies do not take attention to what their business tar targets because they know the government will bail them out in the future if they are in danger in terms of uh, finance. A monopsony buyer, only government. It is quite different uh, from uh, Brazil. Indonesia defense industrial base cannot, uh, uh, mostly lean on the buyer from the government. And also, some official and some people currently think that the foundation of the Defense Industrial Policy Committee since 2010 has been very strategic approach and very new. People forgot that it is nothing new because the previous government during Mr. Habibi era, there were many same approach. then we can have a lesson learned from the Brazil. Brazil, stated the different industrial base by developing state-owned companies first, but finally encouraged the private enterprise to join the different uh, business. This has been very effective policy to build the defense business giant like Embraer. And then more defense industrial base, not merely, more defense industrial base in Brazil, not mean that more secure for Brazil. We observe from the case of CBC and Taurus, both companies are the topest, the greatest, the biggest munition factory in South America. But we can observe also the existence of those companies not parallel with the security situation in Brazil currently. More crime happen in this continent currently. Sorry to say. And then more, more private defense companies means that very hard to monitor to what that business. If not the private company, sorry, if monitoring is in lower level, it means the private company becoming the warlord in this planet in the future. Moral hazard also happened in the Brazilian uh, different industrial base, but in smaller case, if compared with in Indonesian case. I observe uh, from Embraer uh, as the four biggest, uh, fourth biggest commercial jet company in the world after Boeing, Airbus, and Bombardier, Currently, 80% of its spare part from United. So the different business in Brazil currently cannot be separated with the United States uh, business. In 2018, Boeing purchased 80% of Embraer asset. It means that the business quality of the Embraer uh, is in the US level, but the, it means also that Brazilian de, de, defense industrial base have been very competitive, but cannot uh, be far from uh, the United States uh, uh, business. I want to share with uh, some uh, Indonesian friends that now, uh, Indonesia also uh, as the 
the second biggest market for uh, private jet uh, aircraft uh, from Embraer after India. It means that the uh, defense product of uh, Brazil uh, successfully uh, uh, intervened, uh, successfully uh, entered the uh, Indonesian market. Now, um, there are uh, some uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, in terms of uh, different industrial base in uh, Indonesia and Brazil. First, not a single strategy fits for all. It means that either Indonesia and Brazil has a typical strategy to cope with the challenge of the development of the defense industrial base policy. And then different industrial base need policy incentive and protection. It is important because there is a tendency that the local government either in Brazil or in Indonesia still has interest to buy from uh, the uh, outside or international industries. To develop a great uh, different industrial basis, we must understand our industrial base capacity. Not only the different industrial capacity, but all industrial capacity, defense and also commercial. Because mostly the strong defense industries is, the, is started as the trickle down effect from the commercial industries. So never imagine of having a great defense industrial base without the strong commercial industries. Next, to build the strong defense industrial base, we must position defense industrial base as a bridging of security and prosperity. The IB or defense industrial base not merely self-sufficiency of the defense product toward the military, but also as a tool for supporting the national economy. We must correctly articulate self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency not means that all production occur inside the domestic area, inside our national territory. It can be regional or international supply chains involving many international actors. And I want to say with you that defense innovation needs political vision. The defense business needs a national vision how long and how big our national interest will go. For Indonesian and Brazilian case, I encourage because both, both country are regional powers, be regional player in terms of uh, different industrial base. Grasp the regional market instead of begging to the local authority. And I also encourage to develop a pooled defense industrial entities. We need a cluster of industries because the cluster of industries is very important to minimize the resource and finance. Uh, especially it is very important uh, for Indonesian case since until now, the Indonesian government still lean on uh, the state-owned enterprise. And lastly, both Indonesia and Brazil, if both country want to develop a strong defense industrial base in the future, now please don't challenge 
United States of America. I can, it is the most important formula currently to develop uh, DIB without challenge uh, United America. We can, we can um, learn from the Embraer case. Last time, Embraer only focused on uh, private jet uh, business. But after 2011, Embraer expand to produce uh, white body aircraft. And what happened? Five years after that decision, America occupy that business with the representation uh, through uh, Boeing acquisition. Uh, and now Embraer of Brazil, uh, his 80% uh, of this asset belongs to uh, Boeing of America. Thank you, obrigado, boa noite. Selamat malam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bapak Budi Ahmadi, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And now we are going to uh, hear the second speaker, the presentation of, from uh, our second speaker, Dr. Fitra. Dr. Fitra Faisal Hastiadi, PhD, was born in 26 July 1982. He is a lecturer in the Department of Economics, Universitas Indonesia, since 2004. And he was served as a senior advisor to the Minister of Trade 2020. So now let's have a presentation from our second speaker, Dr. Fitra Faisal Hastiari. Dr. Fitra, uh, let me uh, inform you and remind you that uh, we will have a 15, 15 minutes to uh, allow you to give the presentation of your material. Thank you very much. Please welcome uh, the, our uh, second speaker, Dr. Fitra. Okay, yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. So um, I believe I can share my screen now. Okay, here you are. Okay, can can you see it? Uh, my file? Yes, yes, of course. Clear. Yeah, so. Uh, how about my voice? Is it clear? Perfect. Okay. Okay, good um, afternoon. Good uh, morning also to fellow Brazilians. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, for Brawijaya University for inviting me for, for this uh, very um, um, honorable uh, moment. Yeah. Is a joint lecture between uh, Brawijaya University and also Brazilian University. And I'm here as a um, uh, special envoy from University of Indonesia. So um, speaking of Brazil, so, um, so I'm actually a um, football fan. Yeah? So every time I go to the World Cup, I, I always cheer for the Brazilian team. So, and, and with that, I think many Indonesians also share the same feelings as, uh, as for me yeah, uh, in, the, in the World Cup, because we don't have any to cheer to yeah, in the World Cup. Because we, 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 uh, maybe the, the first and the only time we uh, managed to um, uh, go to the World, uh, World Cup is in, in the early 1900s, yeah, when we were, we were still colonized by the Dutch. But still, yeah, we, we still love football, yeah, um, given the uh, lack of quality, but we, we still love football and football is actually part of our culture. It's actually um, similar like uh, fellow Brazilians. So um, with that respect, we're actually very close to each other. So uh, this prologue is actually, um, I, I want to tell something with this prologue, why this is actually very important. Um, in actually bridging um, and connect between the two countries. But before I move forward, now I'll, I'll, I want to actually tell you a story. Yeah, maybe it is a bedtime story for uh, Indonesians yeah, because this is uh, very near to the bedtime. Yeah, but yeah, maybe you can treat this and you can see this as a bedtime story. So the global production network story between ASEAN and also Indonesia. Um, let me begin with international trade because this is a lecture 
I believe uh, we can sense some basic of international trade. Yeah. So international trade is actually an interaction. It's a partnership yeah, between two or more countries. So uh, we do so because we cannot comply and we cannot uh, fulfill our own needs. Yeah. We are actually um, living in a much uh, more connected way than before. Um, Richard Baldwin, uh, so not so long ago, just suggesting that now countries are actually living in a convergence. Yeah, We are seeking for a great convergence. Yeah. Now we are moving at the same path, the same way towards globalization and regionalization. So um, why we need each other? Because yeah, as the theory suggests that we have a comparative advantage. When it comes to comparative advantage, it means that we have something that you don't have and you have something that we don't have. So we trade. That brings the partnership. Under the Axel in model, yeah, we export things that we are capable of producing and we import things that we are not able to produce. So we create partnership. We create mutual benefit to each other. And that is actually the basic of trade. It's a partnership. It's a friendship. Now, the gravity equation in international economics suggests that in order to, in, to make trade intensify, we need several things. Through the gravity equation, we know that there are two most common variables, size and also distance. When it comes to size, we are talking about GDP, GDP per capita, population, um, um, what, what else? Income per capita, yeah, I already uh, mentioned it. Yeah, so it measures the size, but not only size, we also care to distance. Okay. That is why it is actually easier to form a regional partnership. We have ASEAN, for example. We have also the EU. We have ASEAN plus scheme. Not so long ago, we just actually signed the biggest trade deal and the biggest trade scheme in the world yeah, under regional comprehensive economic partnership. One third of the total output coming from this region, ASEAN plus several countries. All in all, we have 15 countries within this RCEP region. Uh, but then again, physical distance, as the gravity equation suggests, this is the Newtonian gravity equation, of course. Yeah. Uh, but the inter international economics adopt this equation yeah, in order to understand how we have the flows in trade, how we have, uh, we have the flows in investment. By the way, trade and investment is an axis. When you have trade, means that you have also investment. You have investment, you're actually creating trade. So uh, from several simulations, yeah, ex ante simulations yeah, but to, to presume and to, to, to forecast the impact of trade. Usually we, we are actually measuring the cost of not joining trade. Yeah? For example, uh, under RCEP just uh, uh, last year, yeah, when it comes to measurement, we are actually trying to measure the cost of joining and the cost of not joining. Yeah? But the cost of not joining uh, is actually we have uh, the trade diversion and also investment diversion. So trade and investment is, is actually a, a very significant matter in terms of trade flows and also partnership. Okay, so uh, coming back again to distance. It is true that uh, forming a partnership within the same region is actually easier, but uh, we must bear in mind that with technology, yeah, as Baldwin suggests, 
that we are now facing the third unbundling. Yeah. When it comes to trade, actually, we can trace this back uh, through the prophecy era, yeah? the times of the prophet. Yeah. At that time, we, we also had trade. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, 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 provincial trade, we have also interregional trade, and so on and so forth. But it's actually very basic trade. But then come along the industrial revolution. Yeah? That is actually accelerating yeah? the industry, hence the trade. With that in mind, yeah, the technology is evolving and coming to the second industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, and the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. Now we can have this advancement in technology. Yeah. Baldwin says this, uh, Baldwin uh, treat this as this third un unbundling in his book, The Great Convergence, yeah. the, the Great Convergence in between countries. Now with the technological advancement, non-physical distance is no longer a matter. So with that, the most troublesome and constraining, maybe not constraining, but the most significant distance is no longer measured by geographical distance, but non-physical distance. What are they? Politics, language, culture, education, development proximity. So ASEAN has been established since 1967, but in terms of intra-regional trade share, it's quite limited. So, so it's only uh, between 24 to 25% intra-regional trade share within ASEAN countries. So we need more than that. 25% is it big or small? Okay, if we compare it with European Union, they have more than 70% of intra-regional trade share. So in terms of economy, we are lagging behind in ASEAN. So we need the pull factor. The pull factor are coming from the ASEAN plus scheme, the plus countries. That's why we have the RCEP, yeah. ASEAN plus five countries minus India. Yeah. At the very original version of RCEP, we have also India, but yeah, India um, withdrew yeah, from RCEP, then we have ASEAN plus five countries. But then again, it's still one of the biggest. It's not one of the biggest, but the biggest trade scheme in the world. So ASEAN alone is not going anywhere. ASEAN need the pull factor, the plus scheme. Yeah. When it comes to ASEAN plus scheme, it's actually quite open. We have open and soft regionalism. We can absorb various countries. Yeah. But again, yeah, one of the most plausible and most significant, yeah, hypothetically speaking, it's actually coming from non-physical distance. That's why Indonesia and Brazil, we share the same interests. That is very much in line with my prologue earlier. We love football. I know Neymar, I know Pele. Yeah, of course you don't know Kurniawan Dwi Lanto, but as Indonesian, we see Brazil like, yeah, we know you. And then we are not that different. You have Favela, we have Rumah Pumo. If your kids are playing in the street, the same. You're also playing football or soccer in the street. In terms of development proximity, we are close. Yeah. So in that sense, we can intensify trade through this, maybe the, the so-called intangible factor. Non-physical distance, but this is actually very mutual. We share the same culture, although we don't share the same, the, the same language, but yeah, yeah we, we, we can find similarities as, as well, differences. But in terms of trade, 
we are actually seeking for similarities. Um, according to the data, of course, now we are growing together yeah, as a part of the global production network. Yeah, in terms of ASEAN, we are actually a part of the Japanese production network since the very beginning. Then it, it comes uh, with China. China established their own uh, production network come and then came along South Korea. But from the very original version of the Akamatsu flying geese model, yeah, this model suggests that Japan was actually the one that introduced this production network in Asia with the second, third, and the uh, second and the third tier countries, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea is actually one part of the big production network. That, that is why we are actually moving together in terms of the production network. Um, that also goes with the rest of ASEAN. Nowadays, ASEAN is a part of global value chain and the global production network. So ASEAN is actually serving as a, one of the most important hub in the world. We have the ASEAN going anywhere, yeah, because ASEAN alone is, just like I said, it's not going anywhere. So we need the pull factor. We need the we need to be become a hub, important hub in the world. And uh, although, if specifically mentioning Indonesia, so in terms of the global production network, we are actually still lagging behind. Yeah. So pre-COVID, this is the pre-COVID situation. Yeah. Uh, we are still lagging behind. So in terms of ranking, so I can show you here the ranking in ASEAN. Okay, so if, if, when it comes to ranking in the participations in global production network, we're lagging behind. Yeah, even if I put also Vietnam here, Vietnam is still above Indonesia. Indonesia is a big country and voicing ASEAN in G20, but in terms of the global production network, in terms of the productivity level, we are actually still lagging behind. This is the pre-COVID situation. But fortunately, COVID is actually for Indonesia, the necessary evil. Although we are quite struggling with this situation, yeah, among other things, of course, we are still struggling. We had this negative growth yeah, uh, throughout 2020 minus 2.07%. And this is one of the worst since 1998, of course. But in terms of trade, in terms of investment, yeah, usually economists think at the margin. So we see whether it is going south or going north. north yeah. And the trend is going north, going upward in terms of export, in terms of trade. Why? Because now we have the massive relocation effect from the big countries. Previously, the big countries just uh, like, uh, for example, the US, Japan, most of the European countries, they have this production network and they are actually seeking for efficiency with China. Yeah, China is actually establishing their one of the most efficient global production network in the world. But COVID-19 changed things. So under the circumstances, we have relocation factor. So the big countries, the big boys now are seeking for resiliency, not only efficiency, but now they are seeking for resiliency. In terms of seeking resiliency in the elusive quest for resiliency, now they are moving away from China, uh, expanding their portfolios yeah, to ASEAN countries. So we can see the data. And Indonesia in 2020 is actually having that kind of momentum. Although it's a very short stint, a very short momentum for Indonesia, but yeah, we have that momentum. Yeah, We need also to maintain the momentum. How we will maintain the momentum? In 2020, we have the omnibus law. This is actually creating the necessary condition, necessary and also sufficient condition uh, to institutionalize 
productivity. Yeah. We have the institutionalization in workers, jobs, and also investment. So with that, maybe, just maybe, we can have a stronger growth in the future. Because just like I argue in my book, Globalization, Productivity, and Production Network in ASEAN, in chapter three, yeah, in order to escape from middle income trap, we need to push export in order to have high growth. So in what average, yeah, we, we still have several more years until we are actually, uh, 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 what do you say, uh, lost our steam. Yeah? So maybe around 2030 or 2035, yeah, there is actually our time to manage things. There is actually our momentum. Why? Because we are actually having this demographic bonus. So we need to capitalize this demographic bonus. And to capitalize this demographic bonus, we need to spur the growth momentum. Yeah. At least we need six to 6.5% of economic growth until 2030 and 2035. Yeah. So in order to have the six or the plus 6% growth, we need to push export at least 9% of growth year on year. And in order to push this 9% export year on year, we need to increase our productivity and efficiency. Yeah, one of which is measured by i -Core, incremental capital output ratio. We have now the i -Core is somewhat lies on six plus. Yeah. The ideal i -Core should be around five. Yeah. So the less you have the i -Core, the more efficient the economy. So with that, we need the upgrade in human resource. We need an upgrade in infrastructure. Of course, uh, also the trade liberalization. Yeah, without trade, without investment, we cannot move, we cannot grow. And also uh, with um, the ongoing institutionalization, we, we need also to improve business climate. Or else, or else we cannot escape from middle income trap. Yeah. Under that situation, under the economic hysteresis, that is coming from lacking of intervention, lacking of the short-run intervention, we might become old before we get rich. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, to, uh, Mrs. Chairman, Mrs. Okay. Chairwoman, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fijal, for your uh, very interesting uh, presentations tonight. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's we move to our uh, third speaker, our uh, the professor Dr. Hosi Marshu Kalfalhu. Uh, again, please give me a uh, minute, only a minute to read a uh, short biography of our third speaker. That professor Dr. Jose Marshu Kalfalhu is the professor of University of Brasilia, Department of Business Management, Brazil. He is also the head of the Business Administration Department at the University of Brasilia. He's interesting in the international business project and project management. So now let's have a presentation from our first speaker, Professor Dr. Jose Marcio Carvalho. Time is yours, Professor. I'm sorry, Professor, we couldn't hear you, your voice. Maybe you have to unmute. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you hear now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, very good. There is a small delay, so but I think we can deal with that. And um, thank you very much for everybody that could make it come to this conference. I found it very, very interesting. Um, several of our uh, presenters before already highlight something. But before I start the, my presentation, I want just to mention that um, there is deep links between Brazil and Indonesia and very old. Uh, the Portuguese empire uh, connected us a long time ago through plants and animals, taste that we share. We use some of the, the plants and vegetables that were in animals that were originated in Indonesia here in Brazil. 
and you use use plants uh, uh, that are uh, originated here in Brazil, like rubber or like cacao or several other uh, products that were originally came from Brazil. So the connection is very old and um, very, um, but we need to develop more, of course. We need to develop more and we need to learn to use the avenues and the opportunities that we have in the internet. Apart from that, we are both giant countries, big populations, big po territories, big, big GDP and uh, not very active in international trade, both countries. And as the ambassadors say, we need to do far better than we are doing in terms of international trade, especially in terms of international trade between Brazil and Indonesia. We have a bright future ahead and we need to find ways to develop it. But I, I want to give you some numbers about how is the current situation between these two countries? Just a second. Let's see if I can share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, clearly, Professor. Okay, thank you. Um, just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. So just want to give you some numbers. Uh, the first part of the presentation is about the Brazil international trade and how we are in terms of international trade. And the data of the whole presentation are coming from the Brazilian Ministry of Economy and are quite recent. So I could manage to get information from just a few, few days ago. As you can see, we have a trade surplus. This is the Brazilian international trade balance. Uh, in blue, in red, in green, you see the Brazilian exports and in blue, the Brazilian imports. And as you can see, uh, in most of the years, in the last 10 years, we are exporting more than importing. So uh, we are doing well in terms of international trade because you have a, we have a superavit, but not so well because the, the volume of trade is not that big. Of course, we can do far more than we are doing so, but, uh, and especially in the last um, 15 years, we are learning to trade with Asia. That's a major achievement for Brazilian economy and development because we are too much dependent in most of our history on the trade with Europe and the trade with um, United States. Just in the last 10 years, we found a way to trade with Asia. And that with a huge impact in our economy and a huge impact, impact in our trade balance. Uh, but you know, China is the big guy in the trade. China is by far the biggest trade partner of Brazil. The, the trade of China is bigger than the next 10, big, uh, 10 biggest uh, trade partners of Brazil, including US and even including Latin American countries like Argentina or Mexico. China is, um, is a major trade partner of Brazil and uh, we had a very fast growth of this trade in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, and, but also we have a strong trade with the United States, Argentina, because you are a member of the same um, Mercosul, 
is the, the Brazilian equivalent or South American equivalent to the Asian, uh, the, the integration market of uh, South America. We have a strong relationship with Europe, uh, the Netherlands. Now you, uh, you, I know that you have a strong link with the Netherlands, but we have an in intensive trade with um, Netherlands too, and Canada, and Japan, and Germany, and Spain, and Chile, and Mexico. But you can see the trade with China is very dominant in our international trade. So here are the numbers. Uh, China, 32, almost one third of our international trade. Our exports will go to China. And United States, number two, 10%. Argentina, number uh, 4%. And in a growing trade with different parts of the world. And Indonesia is one person of our international trade. You see? We, have, we are big countries, big territory, big population, big economy, uh, but very limited trade. So we need to change that. We need to change that. I know that we are very far from each other, but it means very little nowadays because the, um, the, the low cost of transportation and the low cost of communication that can help a lot to develop this, this trade. So I'm sure that we can find something that we want from you and you can find something that you want from us. And then to increase this volume of this trade as the ambassador mentioned. Uh, our main ports. So what are we trading? Uh, sorry, but the government data base just generate data in <laughs> I could not translate, sorry. And what do we export? We export mainly commodities. We export mainly commodities. We are exporting three main products. First one, soya bean. Soya bean. Second one is mineral ore. And third one is oil. These three commodities are the main exports from Brazil for almost the whole world. And uh, in, even into Indonesia, we are exporting, exporting mainly uh, these commodities. And, uh, but uh, um, we have a very big uh, mineral deposit in Brazil and we export to China, to Japan, South Korea, United States, Europe, and we are developing the oil production capacity and we have one of the biggest oil reserves in the world and we're learning to explore it because it's very deep in the sea, but we are developing the technology and they're becoming more and more competitive in this oil business too. But uh, if I can say something that we are really competitive we are competitive in food production. We are really one of the main players in the food production in the world. And that's very strong trend. And that's a very strong trend in the coming future, in the long future too. Because our food production capacity is based on natural resources but also is based on high technologies. And there is something that we can share here. It's because we managed to have a very high production of food in a tropical environment. Both countries are tropical countries. And uh, we know that it's very difficult to have food production in the tropics because of insects and disease but Brazil is learning how to, to have high yields in the tropics, even with temperate originated plants like soya bean. Soya bean is originated in China and we are adapting it to, 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 to growth in most of the country, even in the north part of the Amazon, we are growing soya bean now. So 
These are complex technologies and developed by uh, uh, Brazilian universities and Brazilian research agencies like Embrapa. So since Indonesia is, a may, it has, is one of the biggest population in the world, probably you are going to buy food from Brazil in the coming years, especially because uh, since the population in Indonesia is very affluent, is getting richer and more developed, you tend to eat more meat. You can eat uh, meat from uh, Brazil, but you can also uh, buy soybean and buy corn in order to feed your poultry and your animals in Indonesia, okay? So we're exporting main, main, mainly uh, this commodity, but we are very competitive in the food business globally. Regarding Asian, as Dr. Fitra mentioned, is a major part of the world economy. The future is yours. You have the area, you have the capability, you have the population, and uh, you very, you have a very good um, uh, attitude towards business. Most of the countries in Asia are very entrepreneur. Not only Indonesia, but countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam very dynamic in terms of business, in terms of development. And uh, that's why uh, we are increasing our trade with Asia. As you can see in the last 10 years, we had a very fast increase in terms of the trade. And uh, again, we are exporting the commodities with the countries but we also having an uh, increasing uh, super rapid with the trade with uh, Asia. As you can see in green, we have again the Brazilian exports to Asian countries and in blue, the Brazilian imports. As you can see, the exports are exceeding the imports. So the trade is evolving, but we need to find new products and new services in order to import from Asia. What you are exporting to Asia, the same thing again. The same thing you are exporting to China, which you are um, mineral ore uh, in gray and oil also in gray, but also agricultural products that are in yellow, like soybean, cotton, or corn, which are major imports in Asia, and also exporting uh, in some industrialized products like sugar and, um, um, and this uh, very important uh, export from, our, from us to, to Asia. So oil is the growing trade. We are exporting more and more oil to Asia. It's, it's because we are a reliable source of oil because we are, don't have that much of tension that it, you can find in Middle East or, or in Venezuela. But um, uh, you, so that's why we are getting a bigger part of the world oil market because we, we tend to be a uh, reliable source of oil. So regarding Asian, what do we are importing from Asia? We are importing mainly industrialized goods, as you can see in, in blue. Uh, we are importing industrialized goods, but we are also importing palm oil from Indonesia. We also import in rubber from Indonesia and uh, from Malaysia. And, uh, but we are importing mainly industrialized goods, telecommunications equipments, cell phones from Asia, from several countries from Asia. 
So telecommunications equipment is the growing trade between Brazil and Asian countries. And uh, it's, uh, is, is, uh, and I hope that, uh, that this trade can develop in the coming years. Inside Asia, which are our main partners? First, Singapore, because Singapore is uh, the trade hub of um, uh, Asia, but Singapore is not the main or the final destination of the products that we sell to Asia. So Malaysia, uh, also important partner. Indonesia, a very important partner inside Asia. Vietnam, Thailand, and Philippines. And um, very much of the trade effort of the Brazilian authorities is focused on Asia right now. We are focused on Asia because people here is a bit, a bit frightened because let's say we have a trade that's too big with China. It's too concentrated in China. China is a very good partner. We want to keep this partnership. It's a very important to keep this partnership, but it can be dangerous to have all the eggs in just one bag, just one basket. So all the efforts right now is to increase the trade with Asian countries because they, it's a big economy and a developing economy is a dynamic economy. So we can gain a lot from the increase of trade in East Asia. And what we are importing, we're importing from Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and Singapore. As you can see, Indonesia is a quite important trade partner in Brazil and um, Asia. So here is the trade with Brazil and Indonesia. Again, we have this in the coming, in the last 10 years, uh, a growing trade, a growing trade, and we have a, a bigger export than import to Indonesia. We have a super avid, and we need to learn uh, to import from Indonesia because if you want to have a sustainable trade, we need to do export and import too. So we need to learn. So what we are exporting to Indonesia, mainly agricultural products, cotton and soybean, 37% soybean meal and soybean and cotton, 14% sugar, 22% of the three, uh, our exports to Indonesia and also uh, some other commodities but we want to, to increase the export of industrialized goods. As Dr. Budi Ahmadi mentioned, we are very competitive, not only in agriculture, but also in airplane and defense industry. So we want to increase the export and trade with uh, airplanes. And uh, good to know that the trade is increasing and uh, some defense equipment. As Dr. Budi mentioned, we have a lot to gain, nothing to lose because we are far from each other or we have no threat to each other regarding defense. So it's a trade that for sure that we can learn how to export and how to import from Indonesia too. So soybean is the main trade uh, product between the two countries. And what we are importing from Indonesia, we are importing mainly uh, uh, telecommunications equipment, but also palm oil, palm oil and latex and our major exports from Indonesia to Brazil. So palm oil is, uh, is evolving trade. Um, and um, so to summing up, uh, the exports with Indonesia, are growing and the trade volume is growing. And of course we can do an effort to, to make the things evolve in the coming years. The trade with Asia is growing 
and for sure we can do uh, some effort to uh, um, increase this trade for sure in in uh, uh, commerce for sure we're going to have commercial gain and for sure we're going to have geopolitical gain too i'll just want to show you some pictures of brasilia i know that indonesia is planning a brand new capital we did that um, a long time ago and a very good idea very bright idea so change the capital is not a bad thing. Uh, Brasilia is hope to welcome you. This is the University of Brasilia, and we hope to receive you in uh, some of the lectures, some of you or some of the students inside our, our campus. And here is my contact, Dr. Festa, Dr. Asti has my con contact. And thank you very much for these opportunities uh, um, um, to have this talk with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asti. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marshall, for uh, giving us such a valuable, interesting presentations. Uh, well, let's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our last speaker that there is will be Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Esos MIBDBA. He was born in Malang 10 February 1978. He is a senior lecturer of Business Administration Department, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Prawijaya. He is right now served as Department Secretary of Business Administration Department in our faculty. So let's uh, have a presentation from our first speaker, our last speaker, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Esos MS uh, MIB DBA. The time is yours. Hey, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Well, um, I'm speaking almost in I think it's um, half past nine half past nine already so hopefully um, no one's um, sleepy good morning uh, Brazil to our fellow colleagues in Brazil and good a very good evening for our um, colleague uh, our fellows students um, and international joint lecture participants in Indonesia. Um, before I start, I'd just like to let me share my screen. Okay, so before I start off, um, thank you um, for the insights, um, Dr. Budi Ahmadi, uh, Professor Marcio Carvalho, and Dr. Fitra Faisal. But also I would like to uh, mention um, His Excellency Bapa Ediusup, the Indonesian ambassador for Brazil and our Excel Excellency um, Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science, the Rector of the Republic Indonesia Defense University, and um, all of the colleagues um, who joined and participated in um, the joint uh, lecture tonight. Well, let me start off with um, the topic that um, we'll be talking about is around the areas of digital economy and in Indonesia. And the fact is because it's a large, it's a large ecosystem that the digital businesses are present right now. 
Um, this is the data that I, I've uh, actually I've downloaded from the McKinsey Global Institute. Um, in Asia alone, um, yeah, in Asia alone, um, multinational firms tend to be those that has the scale and international presence to um, be to re be represented in the global 5,000 companies. And within the, the past decade, the amounts are currently growing in a significant number as, as compared to um, other regions such as Europe and North America. And the increased uh, prominence of Asian companies is as um, in the world's economic acti activity is because um, digital businesses nowadays creates a very large and a very flexible ecosystem. Yeah, very large and in terms of its size, in terms of the uh, variety of its services and Yet, um, and indeed, the speed of the rise within that uh, list of the G5000 will continue on to grow. Um, and if we have a look at between 2015 to 2017, um, a company could actually join the G5000 club if they have the valuation or the revenue of $1.3 billion. So it's a large amount of money there. And yeah, talking about Asia, Asia is, is not only emerging, but also the place oh. of Asian, sorry. Um, can you hear my voice clearly, Buasti? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, not only that, in terms of the size of the region, the size of the um, region and uh, number of countries yeah, in Asia, not only because there's, it's huge, one huge market, but also if we have a look at these um, Asian multinationals within that Sorry, within the 11 ecosystems nowadays, you could see the, thanks. You could see the emergence of other major cities in, in Asia, yeah? um, competing to those uh, traditional um, cities that being represented as a high-tech cities, for instance, like um, San Francisco and so forth, and in, in, in few cities in Europe as well. The, the new ecosystem nowadays, if, if taking back, taking, having a look at the Chinese ec ecosystems, for, for example, it's growing very, very rapidly. It's, it's a huge market and it influences other countries to build a similar ecosystem as well. So having a look at those facts, for instance, we, we also have um, cities like Hangzhou, for instance, uh, home to Alibaba, and it's a, a, major, a, a major scale up nowadays and also, you, you have Jeff, uh, Tokyo, you have um, Melbourne, um, New Delhi as well. And the shares actually increased from 20% in 2012 to 30%. So there's actually been a 10%, 10 in, um, eight years. And Having a look at the, at, at the shares, it's rising. Having a look at the shares of 
in number of dollars, it's it's rising. And if we have a look at the, yeah, compared to <laughs> Hello, compared to the Silicon Valley, there are around 10 emerging ecosystems that are that are currently emerging and that are currently doing well. For example, number one is Mumbai, uh, Jakarta. It's also becoming uh, an important um, ecosystem, becoming an uh, important city for the growth of um, digital businesses. And if we have a look at, you know, I, I, I would like to also mention to what um, Schumpeter yeah, called as a creative destruction, whereby the economy is basically based on the principles of supply and demand, right? And competition will influence market price, but yeah, the great engine of capitalism is imbalance. And what he meant was because the imbalance actually creates a creative destruction based on the idea or the notion that innovation leads to chaos. And it could be as a result of a not very innovative products. Yeah. Companies are closing down, a company closure, for instance, and workers are becoming less relevant. So these are the types of destruction that actually he he probably uh, mentioned this around 70 years ago, more than six decades ago, but it happened during the year 2000s where, where a lot of disruptions were going on at that moment. Yeah, The business shifted from the conventional basis to a digital basis. Technology has taken over conventional businesses and conventional methods of delivering the value for the between the producers and the customers. So this is what actually um, I, I I went and had a look at some of uh, Clay, Professor Clayton uh, Christensen's um, definitions on disruptive innovation and. Talking about Southeast Asia, um, Singapore and Indonesia are, are the most, are the major, major players within that te technology ecosystem. Yeah. Later on, I will uh, give you an example of how significant um, the digital businesses play a role in the context of Indonesia. And this is, yeah. what's interesting about this fact is because accessibility of people, Indonesian people to the internet actually is relatively, relatively good in terms of how they can access, how people can access the internet. But in terms of the speed of the internet itself, maybe we are still a bit behind some other countries such as Singapore, Australia, and so forth. And 181 million people are at the productive age and mostly spent around eight to almost nine hours accessing the internet. So it actually, these figures can highlight of why does e-commerce adoption in Indonesia are likely to um, are likely to increase over time, right? First, you have the access to the internet, and then you browse a lot of things within that internet. You browse the social media, you browse the YouTube, and suddenly ads coming in and go, and then you turn into a customer. 
So that's the magic point of the internet, right? From, from not being too much um, informed and afterwards you get a lot of information from the internet that also creates your habit, that also creates your behavior. And um, growth by category, um, travel mobility based on January 2021. This is due to the COVID-19 conditions. And I believe that travel and mobility and accommodation and so forth is slowing down, not only in Indonesia, but globally, yeah. globally. And then the fashion industry, food, personal care, and so forth, these are actually the growth in size by category. So it's, it's interesting how um, people, people adapt to the internet and then um, creates the habit of being consumers and, and e-commerce users. And I've, this is a quote from Richard Branson, yeah, right? People sh uh, share the economy, yeah, because the access of that internet, because people start to access internet and then you share along the economic value to other people, yeah, from exclusive basis to an inclusive context. And this is what happened to Gojek, in Indonesia, we have Gojek. Gojek is like a motorcycle taxi, and and we call it Ojek. Usually, we call it Ojek, and it's branded as Gojek. It's um, been in existence since two thousand and nine, and now they are the major player of the super apps, right? Not only do they travel people around in big bigger cities like Jakarta but also in other cities, but also they actually have developed themselves and created uh, multiple uh, business services. And if we have a look at the, we have having a look at the investors. So it is, um, it creates an interest from the VC especially from those developed economies in Asia, such as Japan, Korea, as well as China. China's coming in to Indonesia with their uh, venture capitals. And yeah, it's basically a tech battle here in Indonesia. Gojek and Grab, Grab is originated from Malaysia, um, Gojek, from Indonesia and look at these values. It's, it's a huge values. And they also brought uh, an interesting ecosystem whereby from these various, yeah, various ser business services, they are able to actually, um, they are able to, to actually help um, small merchants SMEs yeah, to use the services and deliver food, for instance, it's in, through the GoFood and then um, help online shoppers, online shoppers micro to small businesses, as well as moving people around with GoRide. And beside Gojek and that Grab and, and the, the, the brand of Grab, we also have um, Traveloka, which is perhaps almost similar to what um, to Exp Expedia, but and also um, other business uh, marketplace. We also have Tokopedia, and having a look at from where they started in two thousand and nine, ten years, and it's and they are now growing uh, huge and um, I think 
I think in, in this sense, they are the market leaders of that marketplace in Indonesia at the moment. And creating opportunity, that's what um, Indonesia, yeah, Indonesian peoples also adore Alibaba. They've merged to Indonesia and having a look at the huge um, ecosystem that they have built, it is true that um, they are perhaps currently one of the biggest startup or scale-ups available in, in, um, in the world right now. And um, speaking of the emergence to Indonesia, yeah, one of the ecosystems is Ant Financial, which was later changed to Ant Group. It is one of the business lines that focuses on finance and venture capital. So, so indeed, a lot of Indonesian startups do finally get scale-ups from the group or from the emergence of Alibaba as an ecosystem, as a venture capital. And it creates the enhancement of the digital ecosystem itself in Indonesia. So it's, it's quite positive in some way. And if um, we perhaps, if we link that with the context of international trade, then um, nowadays perhaps through this ecosystem, the existence of Alibaba and their ecosystems, um, the exports, the imports of goods from China from it to Indonesia is it's perhaps also increasing as well. So, so in some sense, um, they've made the investment to other businesses, but in other sense, they also have managed to become a major player in the um, in exporting uh, goods and services to Indonesia. So, this is perhaps a story of a transition from from those two apps, just from a normal app to a super app. Yeah. Um, they actually started the business understanding that Jakarta is very crowded. Yeah, People suffer from everyday traffic nightmare. And then suddenly they had the idea to standardize the service yeah, through the apps. So they have also um, recruited and asked people to join as one of the partners, as the, the member of that Gojek um, apps. And then I believe that there's currently a million of those today or hundreds of thousands perhaps who actually um, is being assisted or being helped or, or being um, benefited from the existence of, of those platforms, of those platforms. And this is also the grab. What's interesting about these two, uh, the existence of di digital businesses in, in Indonesia is that a um, couple of years back, um, 2003, 14, 2015, there was actually um, a protest by people and by the community, by business community. Why? Because they make conventional businesses suffer. Yeah. For example, for example, there was a huge rally in Jakarta just um, perhaps several years back. Um, they've actually asked for this type of business to close themselves. To close themselves. Why? Because they've actually affected the low demand for taxi, taxi services. And if we have a look at the context of the policy um, in Indonesia itself, um, those who are categorized as taxi or being regulated by the government had actually have to have to have a yellow plate, for instance. They have to become legal. 
and that's true. They have to uh, have some kind of certifications and they, they must exist as a company. But in that context, it is through that context that um, as the rally went by, there are also inconsistencies that results, there are actually loopholes within that um, those um, regulation that could not define the Gojek and Grab as illegal in some sense. Yeah. Um, sorry, Paipa, uh, we already uh, more than 15 minutes. Could okay. you give a very okay. conclusion? And this makes it very hard uh, and it's it makes very hard sometimes for, for digital businesses because they are heavily regulated and sometimes regulations can be burdensome. Yeah. And another issue is that a is, um, couple of months ago, there's been a, a possible merger issue. And um, there's also, be, it's being highlighted that if those mergers exist, then it could uh, encounter opposition from the competition watchdog, KPPU. Why? Because there will be a monopolistic market or eligible oligopolistic market there. And it's not allowed here in Indonesia. The anti-politic laws might um, provoke one action not to, be, not to um, become possible for that merger. And if we have a look also, if we th think about it, if we think about it, then um, I don't actually believe that entrepreneurs are that greedy in some sense, but in, in other sense, um, they've also managed some efficiencies in the context of renewing their own business model so that they can become um, relevant and efficient. And the policy design in the digital sector, we believe that must not be bounded by traditional business logic it has to be impactful and enables digital transformation with all of its beneficence. And regulators must adopt the agile mindset in order to keep the pace of the innovation itself. So um, this is perhaps the challenges um, to, to government, yeah but also for businesses to be, become relevant and um, find a win-win solution in order, to, um, in order to become relevant for both parties. Yeah. And there's type of policy that would be most helpful in digital businesses such as instruments and so forth. So, loans to preserve company liquidity. These are actually a, a normative, uh, normative how and what should government do in the context of uh, making digital business much more attractive, but also um, making digital businesses um, continuing and sustaining in the future. Um, that's all from me, perhaps. Thank you very much. and. Time is yours, Buasti. Okay, thank you very much, Pa Iqbal, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentations in this next. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we already reached uh, 10 p.m. actually right now in Indonesia. And so we are right now uh, come to the question and ask for sessions. As I mentioned before, we will give a time for our discussion. We have three discussions. And the first chance I will give to Dr. Sigrid Guilalmond to uh, give the statement or maybe the question directly to our speakers. So Dr. Sigrid Guilalmond, if there are any statement or questions, um, the time is yours. Okay, um, hello to everyone. Good morning, good evening. It is a pleasure to participate in this session. Very interesting. Thank you so much for all the insights we had during this, this time together here. 
I am very happy with all the, the comments and contributions the speakers gave us. And so I'm going to set a question. I'm sorry, I saw so many questions on the on the chat. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm not um, I'm not uh, overpassing anyone in front. But well, my question is addressed to all the speakers. So thank you, Dr. Amarula Octavian. Thank you, Dr. Fitra Faisal. Budi Ahmad, it's a pleasure to see you again. Dr. José Marcio, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. So uh, my question is uh, related to the defense industry or international trade. And I would like to know what is the main challenge that you would elect as, as uh, a challenge that adds a lot of complexity to the development of the defense industry or the trade, the international trade. So a, a challenge that would reside probably on the ecosystem, on the uh, innovation ecosystem or um, public organizations ecosystem that adds uh, the most complexity um, to the development of these spheres. And again, thank you so much for your reflections on, upon that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sieg. So the question is, what is actually the challenge to uh, that is lady, uh, the trade industry and also the defense industry uh, between Brazil and Indonesia? So that's the first questions. And uh, if uh, if that it, it if we get uh, any feedback from our speakers, please, um, maybe Professor Marshall. Yes. Okay. Time is just Prof. Yeah. Your microphone, Jose Marcio. Yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't unmute your microphone, Professor? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, for the host, please assist us to unmute the, uh, the speaker of Professor Marcio. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, actually, I don't see a problem at all. I just see opportunities in this sector because Brazil is a very peaceful country. We have a very long tradition of peace in Latin America with our neighbors. We are, we are, we are involved with in very few wars along our history. And uh, that's Peace is a very, very Brazilian thing, very, very much. And um, we have very good relationship with our neighbors in, in Latin America. But since the country is so big, we need to invest on defense. And we did that in the last years. And as you are in defense industry, and since you are a big country, you cannot just import anything or everything. Some of the technology you need to develop on your own. So what we managed to do, especially as Dr. Buji mentioned in the air sector, in the airplane, but also in different fields. And I guess um, this technology is, will be available for good partners of the country. Uh, and I would say uh, the technologies are not really to go to, to the developed parts of the world, but uh, because uh, they have already their own technology. But I'm sure that uh, some of technology that uh, we develop can be used in Indonesia. And uh, I'm sure that some of the technology that you already developed, we can use here in Brazil. So I don't see problems at all. I just see opportunities in this field because we are not a threat to each other. We have only good things from a, uh, to develop this partnership in all fields, only good things. So uh, I don't see a problem at all. That, that's just my opinion. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Marshall, for the, the answer. So this is quite interesting that that is the uh, Professor Marshall also uh, already mentioned that that is no problem, but that is uh, only uh, opportunities uh, to strengthen the collaboration between two countries. 
to develop uh, all of the trader industries. Uh, maybe is there any uh, feedback or uh, another comment from our speakers regarding the uh, Dr. Secret questions? Maybe Bapak Budi or maybe um, also Bapak Fitra or maybe Bapak Iqbal? Okay. Uh, if there is no other uh, statement or feedback, uh, let me move to our second discussions. That the, our st uh, second uh, and third discussion is actually our students from uh, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Brawijaya. Uh, the first discussions from students uh, we have uh, uh, Joan, if Joan Dwi Putra. Uh, I will give you five minutes to give a question or comments, Joan. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So time uh, is your uh, five minutes, please. Okay. Thank you so much for the chance uh, to follow this agenda. Uh, my name is Joan Dwi Putra. I'm a student of public administration, term 2018. Now I'm in a sixth term of my study. Well, I'm, I would like to respond and perhaps ask a question to Mr. Fitra Faisal presentations. It's related to the policy recommendation uh, to develop and strengthen the industry. Uh, you explained that there are four points uh, to strengthen the industry, such as human resource upgrade, logistical infrastructure, and then promote trade liberalization and improving business uh, climate to encourage investment. I personally agree with these uh, points because like the first human resource upgrade, as we know, I think it will be useless if we have a lot of quantity of the human resource, but we have a less quality of the human resource itself. So yeah, I, I totally agree with this. Uh, upgrading or developing the human resource has become uh, a very, very important thing. I think it's not only will be important in industry, but also will be important for another aspect. And second, logistical infrastructure. Yeah, infrastructure, I think it's become something important too because it will be, you know, it will make something will be more effective and also will be more efficient, especially related to uh, the cost. A good logistical infrastructure, I think it will make uh, the price or the cost is become more uh, cheaper. As we know, uh, some example in Indonesia, for example, in Papua, uh, some of our in Papua still have uh, very lack of infrastructure. So the distributing of uh, logistic or the distributing of products or goods, it's, it's uh, become a little bit hard. So it affected the prices and the prices become very uh, expensive. But fortunately, our government in President Jokowi era, uh, they provide uh, better infrastructure in Papua. From what I heard, uh, the price of gas online in Papua is almost uh, right now, it's almost the same with uh, gasoline prices in Java Island. And then promote trade liberalization. Yeah, uh, a free trade and an uh, international trade, something like that is also a good thing to be promoted. Uh, especially, we are not working uh, ourselves, right? So we need to make uh, good cooperations between country or between continent. And the last is improving business climate to encourage investment. And another thing that makes me uh, agree with this uh, policy recommendation to strengthen the industry uh, are the fact that exists in Indonesia, uh, the obstacles that exist in Indonesia. Uh, there are some obstacles such as the less, the less of raw material. I'm not sure that our country, Indonesia, uh, really, really less of raw material or not, but based on fact, our country is quite often, you know, uh, do import from another country. Right, and then second, less of infrastructure, like what I've said before. There are still some places in Indonesia that still bet on their infrastructure, and then the less of utilities, such as the using of uh, electricity, water, gas, and etc. And also the less, the less of skilled personnel, uh, a person or people who expert on at things. Right, it's totally related with the first point of your recommendation less of skilled personnel. The last, of course, the pressure from another country that related to the 
uh, import industry and some stuff like that. I think I just want to respond and express my uh, agree related to the policy recommended recommendations to. The recommendations is only qualified in country uh, like Indonesia, which is development country, or it also could be able to be amended in uh, advanced country, something like that. Perhaps you may give more explanation about that. Thank you. I think that's all from me. Thank you. So yes. much. Okay. Thank you very much, Joan, for uh, uh, giving us. Uh, a statement of your agreement. Maybe we could have a feedback, a direct feedback from Dr. Fitra about the Joanne statement. Um, with regards to the statement, I can I can't agree more. So yeah, I second that uh, argument. Uh, with regards to um, some follow up um, questions, maybe. If we have time, maybe we can uh, uh, talk offline and then you can have my number and then uh, we can discuss later on because, yeah, uh, we, we only have a very limited time here. So, okay, so Joan, you have a uh, um, opportunities to uh have a connected with dr fitra uh and dr fitra will give you time to, to discuss directly with dr fitra with it, uh, your uh, arguments before okay so let's move to our third discussion that I'm will so be uh, uh the third uh discussions is also our students uh from business administrations uh christine manula are you there yeah Okay. Here. So, okay. So, time is yours, Christine. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for the chance. Uh, I also would like to say thank you for all of the Mr. Speakers. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Christine Manulang. Currently, study at Business Administration, major 2019, Brawijaya University. Uh, I would like to share what I get from this webinar, and I also would like to ask some question at the end. Like all of these, like all of those explanation give us a new insight and knowledge. Since for this semester, I get international business, and this help a lot. Like the comparative issues between Indonesia and Brazil, which quite easy to understand since Mr. Oscar was presented them with table. And also another topics that talk about policy recommendation to strengthen the industry is really give me a new insight that actually there are still a lot of things that we can do to strengthen our industry. I also would like to say thank you to Mr. Joseph for letting us know the specific data of Brazil international threat. And also thank you, sir, for the interesting information about Brazil at the end of your presentation. It's my pleasure to know about them. But I would like to know something like, uh, we know that the status quo is COVID-19 axis. How is the update of COVID-19 in Brazil, sir? How the COVID-19 impact the industry, industry in Brazil? What sector that impacted the most? Like for example, the food and beverage business is increasing in Indonesia. And how about the Brazil? What about the Brazil? And then about digital economy, since digital economy users increase, I have some curiosity about it, uh, Mr. Iqbal. Like I would like to know about your opinion. What will happen if Indonesia are lacking in digital economy? What will happen to traditional firms in Indonesia? And if you say we need to make them change, how we can make the transition be smooth? Like will the policy will be the only thing that we need? And also in your opinion, when will Indonesia be ready for the digital economy? What is the sign if Indonesia ready for this? And what will happen if Indonesia is not ready, but the digital economy has been growing inside? Uh, I'd be glad if you want to share from your point of view, sir. And I think that's all. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, I do apologize if there is any mistake. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. So, Christine, uh, give us uh, two questions uh, to uh, two speakers. The first speakers. Uh, the first question goes to 
uh, Professor Marshall related about the effect of COVID-19 to the industry in Brasilia. So let's uh, have a feedback or uh, maybe an uh, 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 explanation from uh, Professor Marshall about your questions. Professor, Professor Marshall? Thank you very much, Christine. Very important question, very important indeed. Uh, Thank you, the, sir. The, the, the thing is that uh, Brazil is not doing well with COVID. Uh, public authorities uh, is very similar to what happened to the United States, what happened in Brazil. Uh, public authorities think that COVID was not that important. They think that uh, it was not so big and they did not put in place policies in order to stop its spread and also policies in order to, to get the vaccine. So right now we are paying the bill. Right now um, we are in one of the countries the highest level of infection and um, but the, but but now things are the vaccines are arriving we are developing our own vaccine and uh, but we have a huge impact in terms of the in terms of business in Brazil but surprising enough regarding uh, international trade we are not affected at all in fact, actually, we are having a record in terms of exports because especially many countries in the world, but especially China, decided to stock food uh, because of the, the, the dispute with US and also because of the COVID scenario. They decided to stock food. So we are having records in terms of sport. So internally, the short answer internally we're not doing well but externally we're doing surprisingly well okay thank you very much for the uh, answer professor marcio and uh let's move to the second questions uh from the christian to our uh, speakers, Dr. Iqbal, about the digital economy. Uh, could we get uh, feedback from uh, Dr. Iqbal related to the questions of, uh, from uh, Christine? Yes. Um, how can we make a digital economy competitive? Then um, we have to start to be ready for that. I mean, it has it has become a trend nowadays and we just have to get along with it, right? If, you, if we have a look at um, how many people uses Facebook, how many people uses social media such as um, Instagram, yeah, where, they, where um, household businesses such as um, those micro businesses or businesses that run um, on a home-based business uh, on a, uh, from home, for instance, they, they've used up a lot of these um, social medias in order to uh, promote the, uh, promote um, the products, as well as people started to, to promote themselves, keep um, promoting services, um, various uh, types of services, whether it's um, hospitality services, such as hotels, such as um, homestays and so forth. Uh, it's through a lot of platforms. And indeed that, um, again, the, we have to be ready for any types of changes, especially um, when it comes to technology, then we have to embrace it. We can't go against technology because um, that is one, yeah, by 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 our capability and ability of absorbing new new um, types of technologies and approaches, then it'll enrich us in terms of um, our capabilities as well for Indonesian people, for instance, and also in terms of regulation. So, government, um, I believe, is also uh, nurturing 
these businesses, these digital businesses, and making sure that um, none of the, not none, but I think limited impact. I think the regulations are supposed um, to control the businesses, but on the other hand, it cannot harm businesses. And I think that's one point where governments, um, the Indonesian government is, is trying so hard in order to facilitate that because as we know that um, these platforms, social platforms and these digital platforms such as um, the ones that I've mentioned before, it helps create opportunities. It helps people to um, become, um, you know, available in terms of they are moving from an unemployed basis into an em employment, yeah, into a self-employed, being self-employed, and they are currently facilitated by these um, technologies, these platforms. And I suppose that ready or not, the change is coming and whether or not we are ready and we embrace those changes, then um, it's, I think if we don't embrace those changes, we will be left behind with uh, and becoming less competitive to um, other countries and um, become, eventually become irrelevant. Okay, perhaps I think that's um, my feedback, uh, Bu Asti, Dr. Asti. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Papa Iqbal, for the feedbacks and the explanation is quite interesting. Also, we are talking about COVID nineteen and how Indonesia survive and Brazil survive. That's just quite interesting. So, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we also have a, a lot of questions through the chat, but uh, we are sorry that we only uh, could uh, give uh, two uh, two two uh, questions. I uh, could that you wrote in the chat. So the first question uh, comes from uh, Bapak Ali Zainal Abidin. It's directly mentioned to Pak Budi Ahmadi. He's asking about why do you suggest uh, from your presentations, uh, you suggest avoid challenges with the US. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it still possible to compete with the US? So that's uh, the, the direct questions. Uh, for the for Pak Budi Ahmadi, uh, could we get uh, your feedback, Pak Budi? Pak Budi, thank you. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, most of the international defense industries now is still connected with the uh, United States uh, defense industrial basis. Like uh, the case of Embraer, I mentioned Embraer is one of the, now the, the, <coughs> the, the giant, the giant uh, of the defense industrial base from, uh, Brasilia and number four in the world after after Boeing, Airbus, and Embraer. Before 2011, uh, it is uh, Embraer uh, has successfully uh, produced the uh, private uh, private uh, uh, jet uh, uh, aircraft uh, class and. Around uh, 15 uh, companies in Indonesia use uh, 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 that kind of uh, product. But after years, uh, Embraer plan to expand uh, its business uh, to produce the, the white body aircraft. 80% uh, of the supporting uh, uh, spare parts for Embraer exists in the United States because uh, they need a radio, they need radar, they need uh, many kind of uh, spare part that cannot uh, be locally produced uh, inside the Brazil. Uh, sort after the United States uh, defense industrial base thought that 
Embraer uh, uh, started to, to challenge uh, the uh, United States uh, defense industrial base, they decided to occupy uh, Embraer because Embraer is uh, the public uh, company. So it is a simple a sample of why uh, currently uh, I encourage uh, to uh, all uh, different industrial bases in uh, developing countries to, to not to challenge United States, not now, but uh, because it is the uh, empirical fact uh, from uh, uh, Embraer, because I came to Embraer uh, four years ago and I discussed with many uh, friends there. And it is not uh, possible for, I think, for Brazilian uh, and Indonesian different industrial uh, base to, to challenge uh, uh, America now. Maybe, maybe in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the answer, uh, Bapak Budi Ahmadi. Uh, the last questions uh, uh, from Alusio Camargo is also uh, to directed to uh, Pak Budi Ahmadi and Bapak Fitra. He asking, could you tell us how Indonesia has encouraged greater private sector participation in strategic sector, such as space and defense? so that companies are not dependent on public budget resources to develop. And could you also provide an overview of public policies related to innovations in uh, Indonesia? This is from Alucio Camargo. I think that it's from, uh, he's from Brazil, maybe the student uh, from Professor Marcio. So uh, could we get uh, the answer or feedback uh, from Bapak Budi Ahmadi again and Bapak Fitra regarding to the Alusio Camargo's question. Actually, Alusio Camargo is a director of the Brazilian Space Agency. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much for the information, Professor Marcio. So, uh, could we get uh, the feedback from Pak Budi or maybe Pak Bapak Fitra first regarding the question from uh, Alusio Camargo. Yeah, okay. So uh, with regards to the public-private partnership, this is actually an ongoing issue. We have now the uh, upcoming omnibus law with uh, several uh, rules and regulations to the partnership in a whole different level. And yeah, of course, um, in 2020, the sectors because we have only a limited budget. So, uh, in terms of COVID uh, stimulus. Um, Brazil have more than us, and so we have the private sector, of course. So uh, this is actually uh, uh, the way to finance the, the future development. Not only coming from the the uh, system, the process, the process, of course, but uh,
Okay, uh, Dr. Sutra, maybe there is uh, like an um, uh, internet connection. I'm, I'm not really sure because we couldn't hear you clearly. Do you want me to repeat my answer? Okay, could you hear me clearly? Sorry. Well, uh, I'm not, yeah, well, yeah, maybe. yeah, well, actually, I'm not really sure which uh, internet connection that have a trouble right now. So uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's already, uh, maybe it's already late because I, I mean, I'm not really sure. So, uh maybe let's we move to the um feedback to from uh dr Budi. Okay, could you hear my voice clearly? Bapak Andi, Pak Iqbal, or maybe Prof. Marshall? I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Can hear. okay, 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 okay. Maybe there is uh, some uh, 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 trouble in uh, Dr. Faisa. I'm not really sure maybe which part have a trouble in the next connection. So, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, actually, right now in Indonesia, uh, the time is uh, is already ten thirty p.m. So, uh, it's come to our end part of this event. So, I'd like to thank so much to the speakers for the informative and interesting presentations, and to the participants for very active participation today. And it's surprisingly that until 10 30 p.m. We still have uh, around 300 active participants in uh, our seminar today. And hopefully, this seminar will be beneficial for everybody. And right now, allow me to give the session for our host, Associate Professor Dr. Anders Andi Feftawi J. MDA PhD, to deliver the closing remarks and the closing ceremony. Time is yours, Professor. It Okay, thank you, Ibu Asti. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, thank you. I would like to give a rough conclusion from the International Joint Lecture today. I'm very... Uh, uh, I would like to see uh, several points, especially when we look the presentation from uh, rector of Universitas Patahanan uh, that mentioned about six policy initiatives in the defense industry. I think that's quite interesting, yeah? And also uh, he mentioned about university and research institution involvement is required to promote uh, continuous development. I think this is uh, a good point in terms of collaboration. The, uh, and we know in the uh, uh, public administration paradigm, we know the the, the current uh, theory uh, develop what we call it uh, pentahelic uh, governance. The one of the helic is about uh, how the university involves yeah in uh, the development uh, of industry and etc. And uh, he mentioned also Brazil is one of the most important partner for Indonesia. And also from Professor Marcio, uh, thanks a lot. We learned a uh, lot of things from what you uh, said to us and also answered some questions. Uh, 
uh, related to the Brazil and Indonesia international trade. Uh, we look yeah, to China, but uh, between Indonesia and Brazil, uh, just cover about 1% of their uh, uh, in terms of uh, international between uh, Indonesia and Brazil. And uh, from Dr. Fitra, this is very interesting about in, in ICT industry, electronic and telecommunication, having the highest participation level. I think this is the most important point here yeah. because in the car world using ICT yeah, and this is also cut a lot of cost uh, and anything time energy yeah. and I think uh, in this is the future the future of our economy we cannot uh, 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 we cannot avoid the yeah. They come already, and then we should adjust uh, with the current situation, uh, especially in the COVID uh, situation now, enhance digital economy. As you know, uh, including in my uh, uh, in my country and my faculty or in my house myself yeah mostly now use uh, uh, an opportunity we can look up yeah and also uh, from Dr. Budi also talking about the policy, public policy defense industrial base. That we know uh, that uh, we need to uh, clean up uh, uh, several burden here and he comparatively uh, uh, compare between uh, Indonesia and Brazil sector uh, US is still dominant yeah. Not now we Going to challenge USA, uh, maybe the next uh, ten or thirty years. Yeah, I think that in YouTube, yeah, you can go to the Department of Public Administration. YouTube link and you can also uh, hear again me 
ya what we discuss today want to give uh, appreciation to the all speakers yeah and uh, please uh for you to every to uh present So next, uh, Bapak Fitra Faisal Hastiadi, PhD, and next. And uh, thank you from University of Indonesia. Yeah. And he also spoke person uh, of international trade in Indonesia. And then also yeah, for Bapak Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, I would like to thank for the presentation today. And then keep going. For Dr. Siglid Guilamun, or maybe someday you can visit us here yeah, with Bapak Jos Marcio Carvalho, and also maybe with Professor Kimura, yeah, can come here to Prawijaya. And also, this is our uh, student, uh, student of uh, public admission in public administration. Yeah. And then uh, another one is uh, business administration student, yeah, Christine Manula. This is also from international class because we have uh, international. Okay. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. And I would like to, uh, to thank to all participation today and also the, the all guests. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for much you. Yeah. Thank you. Pak Dubes masih di sini juga mungkin ini. Yeah. Doctor, thank you very much, sir. It was a immense pleasure. Thank you, thank you, Pak Marcio. Very good. What time is it there? What time in Brazil now? Ah, Dr. Vitraini, Brazil is here. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you very much, people. Have a good night. Hope to see you. Thank you.
Thank you, Prof. Marciu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marcio, for your coming and give up a very insightful presentations today. Thank you very much again. See you Thank in you our next much, event, Dr. maybe in Dr. Brazil. Yeah, I hope so. I hope you can make it. Hope you can come here. I hope also, Professor. <laughs> it will be a very interesting event. If, if I could go to the person, please. Okay. Thank you, Andy, Dr. Andy. Thank you, Dr. Bambang Supriano. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. Dr. Dr. Budi, Dr. Fitra, and Dr. Iqbal. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you, Professor. See you. Closing class, please. So thank you very much for our speakers and participants and everyone here, our colleagues. See you in the, our next events and good night. And good night for Indonesian and good morning for uh, Brazilians. See you again in um, the next event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Marci. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Marci. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Marci. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,